welcome everyone. I just uh, was sitting in the office one way and I heard Luann's class ended with an ovation. And I felt very sad because I've never gotten an ovation in the class. But then I remembered that I, we always conclude with the elephant's teach. Which is a little inside joke, but it is, universally that is not the book that, to get an ovation. Um, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Robert Reeves and it's my honor to direct the uh, MFA program and uh, to welcome you uh, tonight to the MFA uh, student reading. Um, I'm never really comfortable with the uh, notion of student readers because uh, you know there are no minor leagues in writing and so uh, I certainly encourage all of you to, not to think of yourselves as student writers and of course uh, that is very much the case. Uh, we're all colleagues uh, here. Um, this is an evening that is among my favorites, and over the years this tradition has generated a number of memorable evenings and memorable moments. Uh, some of the moments of hilarity. Uh, I, uh, and there was a time before we were enforcing time restraints that uh, someone, and before we were, when we were kind-hearted and didn't want to say anything, but someone read three chapters of a novel. <laughs> and we were all gasping and just too nice to say anything. And uh, this uh, novel uh, turned out, was kind of read like a, uh, someone was a, a, a divorce uh, situation. And so the three chapters were kind of like a trans transcript of a, of a settlement discussion with Roy. <laughs> and, uh, and everybody was, of course, bored to tears, except for me. And I was going through a divorce at the time, so I was <laughs> learning something from it. Um, anyway. Um, uh, the history of this uh, particular evening uh, uh, is we started this about 10 years ago uh, during the writers' conference when we had a participant reading, and then it was not any you know, great insight to add it to the MFA program. But uh, I'm pleased to say that this year uh, it has blossomed uh, that we have an uh, MFA reading in Southampton, uh, which was extremely successful. We also have script readings both in Southampton and here. I've heard rave reviews about the script reading uh, here, which is, uh, of course, willing to be a part of that. And then we will conclude this semester with a reading here. We're also, in terms of building these traditions, uh, we are having our first uh, MFA graduation ceremony uh, on uh, May 24th, and uh, very excited about that. And congratulations to you all. Um, uh, the reason we are so uh, convinced that we can grow this program is simply because of the quality of the people who attracted to it and the quality of the work that comes out of it. So, um, I should mention to you in terms of growth that uh, this summer we are adding for the first time to our usual uh, range of uh, uh, writer uh, workshops, a film production workshop and a workshop for directors. Um, so we are expanding to in our efforts to build this art community and to rule the world through arts. <laughs> so, um, I also am thrilled to be here at Manhattan because Manhattan is crucial to everything we do frequently. Um, in our meetings in Southampton, uh, our weekly staff meetings, someone in this room will always mention Manhattan. What about Manhattan? And of course, my answer to that is always is that Manhattan doesn't have to be mentioned in particular because it is central to our identity in there. So we think of it as all part of a single uh, entity. And the person uh, who uh, says that uh, in these meetings is someone very well known to you, uh, who is as crucial to our programs as is Manhattan, who is someone who has been the the driving force to build uh, Manhattan into the thing that it is uh, today, and someone you know well, who is a colleague, a terrific writer, and a wonderful friend. So please welcome Emmanuel Brown. Thank you. nothing but a twinkle in Bob Reeves' eye. And we're only here tonight because he thought it first. And how cool is that? So. <laughs> um, and the students 
students reading tonight are proof of the progress of that vision. And over the last four semesters, I've had the privilege of being in the classrooms with you all. And I just want to say that this has been reflected back to me by visiting professors, that not only are they impressed with your commitment to your own work, but how much you invest in each other's to dig deep together to find the, the true moment, the real word. And of that generous spirit, I'm incredibly proud. So this is for you. <laughs> um, to start out our reading tonight, please welcome Jennifer Greenstein. She's a journalist of merit on her own, but she's also the author of a very fine first novel, Scramble Legs. Please welcome Jennifer. This piece is called, uh, This Baby Will Save Your Life. In her 18th hour of labor, when the doctor suggested a C-section and Rachel, sobbing, agreed, Tim opened Star Magazine and began to read aloud. In a sober, non-judgmental voice, he recounted the rehab stay of a once promising starlet, the $16,000 shopping spree of a thick-lipped blonde, and the infidelity of an undernourished rock star with his daughter's best friend. While Rachel's pubic hair was shaved and a catheter was inserted in her vagina, Tim's voice did not waver. When he paused to turn a page, a nurse confided, this is the best delivery I've ever worked. <laughs> During the surgery, Rachel closed her eyes and tried to think about swimming in the lake at Pop Pop's cottage her feet touching the slimy bottom. Her body was not hers. It was a weightless thing, and she was floating through the room, listening for the raised voices that would tell her the baby was here. Tim stroked her head, which was covered with a papery blue cap, and she understood that she was never going to fall back in love with him. She was in love with Derek, a dead man. Tim was sweet and kept asking her if he could do anything for her, and her heart remained closed to him. There was nothing to be done. She heard a squeal and a voice asking, Dad, to come look. Tim let go of her hand. In her haze, she felt pleasantly worn out, as though she had finished a long race and pulled herself out of the water. She looked at the crowd, hoping to hear what they thought of her performance but no one was paying attention to her. Her daughter had a full head of black hair shellacked on her skull and a bitter, weak cry. Tim brought her over in his arms. She remembered Derek in a grocery store, helping her shop for a Thanksgiving she would spend without him. He had cradled a 20-pound turkey in his arms as though it were a baby, cooing and pretending to suckle it with the pull cords on his sweatshirt. He was like one of those kids who finishes college but keeps living in town and playing pool at the campus pub. He was 30, going on 20. Spontaneous, thrillingly reckless, and always eager to go to bed with her. Tim was none of those things. Tim was a mortgage-paying, lawn-mowing husband, and now a father. They're stitching you up, Tim said. She couldn't hold the baby yet. Her arms were pinned down with IVs. She wanted to know what the baby looked like, if her ears stuck out like Rachel's, if she looked like her father. Tim was shaking hands with the nurses and doctors, thanking them, praising their good work. And next we have Easton Diverna. Stand in a group and look intimidating. 
um, practice falling over guardrails, attacking a, a dummy hero futilely until thwarted, <laughs> sail through the air into some uh, sort of random collection of barrels or boxes, sneer and grunt and never really say much and so on, he was not quite sure what to do with himself. So he took a walk. The land around the Domination Dome was cold, hard, and unyielding. Signs painted with crossed out silhouettes of rabbits, chipmunks, and of course the amazing Captain Hero were scattered about the complex. R stopped and stared at the sign of the dreaded and feared hero, but then a butterfly, something he had heard of but never seen, fluttered past him and away from the complex. Art was struck with the sudden desire to walk out past the dead and dusty wastelands that were the grounds of the Domination Dome, and to go where he had never been, to where it was green and birds sang and people laughed and were individuals, to where the amazing Captain Hero hailed from. But then the siren sounded, and the henchmen assumed their battle stations. There was a great battle, and Dr. Domination suffered severe losses. Henchmen were ripped apart, punched to death, cleaved in two, and vaporized. But in the end, the battle went worse for the amazing Captain Hero. Not so amazing now, R said. He was to guard the lily-plated holding cell. It was not a weakness, but Captain Hero had a soft spot for the flower. And within the Domination Dome, Dr. Domination had set up a radiation-free greenhouse to grow the flowers. You'll pay for what you've done, R said. Me? Captain Hero sat on the ground with the room battered. He held a lily to his nose. He was a giant of a man, square chin and chiseled body. A red and white mask concealed his face. I'll pay. You work for a genocidal maniac. If you think this cell or you, he sneered, a henchman will contain me, or that the other members of the Amazing A's won't finish what I've started, then I... He paused and looked deep into R's eyes. Then I pity you. I pity all of you. What's your name, anyway? R was filled with hatred for Captain Hero, which was nothing new, but he was also filled with awe. The conflicting emotions sent his single-minded mind into an ecstasy he'd never experienced or even dreamed of. My, uh, my name's R. R? R what? R Roddington. How do you spell that? A? R? E? <laughs> no. Only R. Just the letter. <coughs> so your name is a letter. I see. What of it? Don't you find that a bit ridiculous? Captain Hero stood up and walked to the bars of his cell. Lilies were tied all along them. He closed his eyes and breathed in deeply. These really are magnificent. You know, if Dr. Domination, you all, would lighten up on the nuclear waste and radiation and spread a little fertilizer around here. I'm not here to talk to you, R said. So then what's your purpose? What is the point of you, R? R's shoulders hunched and he looked smaller than he had before, though he was not big to begin with. Do you, do you know what the destroy it all -er is? R asked. <laughs> Captain Hero held the lily to his nose and sniffed. He shook his head. Well, it was designed to destroy you. And you'll see it very soon. Dr. Domination will be calling on you shortly. Captain Hero shrugged. I've been captured before, R. I've been threatened with worse. But do you know why I'm still here? He waited, but R did not respond. I'm here because the forces of good will always prevail. Had Captain Hero been speaking to Dr. Domination, there might have been a witty rebuttal in the favor of the forces of evil, but he was speaking with R. R did not have a witty rebuttal at his disposal. <laughs> Have you ever been outside this ruin of a fortress? Have you ever seen the world, R? To R, the Domination Dome was the world. It was all he had known since he was a little hench baby. And all, he had, and all he had ever aspired for was the destruction of Captain Hero and the fall of all mankind. But then today, of all his days, R stepped back suddenly from the lily-covered bars. The hero was pulling the flowers down. His body shook with every flower he destroyed until the bars were cleared of them. What are you doing? R reached for the communicator on his belt, but Captain Hero was through the bars and crushing R's shoulder. R screamed and bit down on his tongue. No, he cried. But Captain Hero grabbed R's face and shoved his head into the concrete wall behind. R's skull crumpled under the incredible force. The gray-suited body of the, the henchman fell to the floor limp, eyes open, glossy, and staring. But then, off in the distance, R was in a field of green with the sun shining brightly down on him. He wore a red and white suit and stood tall and strong next to the amazing Captain Hero. And at their feet lay Dr. Domination, broken and defeated. And a little ways off there flew a butterfly. Thank you. <laughs> next up we have a great writer who I've had the privilege of having a class with this semester, Kathy Zimmerman.
an essay and a monologue. monologue. Tension is high as each child approaches the mic. Parents jockey for position, camcorders humming and beeping. Fine white tassels sashay back and forth as the graduates of the Children's Hour Preschool come up one by one to announce their names. This is the only school that all four of my children attended. At Christmas, I hang four little chalk slate ornaments framed with popsicle sticks that were carefully glued on in this classroom in Ozo Park, Queens. My third child, Jody, didn't speak in class till a month before graduation. Teachers had warned us the school would put her in special ed if she didn't speak by kindergarten. At home, she was a normal, confident, even sometimes defiant child, but the real world could strip her of that bravado in an instant. Most of the boys in her class were loud and brash, sons of men who pumped iron in their basements and wore shirts half open to reveal gold chains over solid muscle. I'd be scared too. <laughs> Six of us, two parents, two grandparents, and two teachers, hold our collective breaths as we wait for our shy little Jody to speak. The boy to her right, Nicholas Castro, bounds out of his seat and has already said, my name is, by the time he reaches the mic. Jody frowns at Nicholas and sits ankles crossed and hands folded neatly in your lap until he is back in his seat. She slowly rises and traces his steps, leans into the mic and quietly says her name. Six sighs of relief. If God himself had spoken, it would not have meant more to me. Small as it seems, this event was, for my child, a huge step coming out of the self and into the world. We never dared to imagine that such a shy child could ever be the outgoing young woman she is today. Jody turns 20 this week, a video of her birthday cake, and one from the winter she turned three, drew comments from most of the family online. Farther down the page, below scores of birthday wishes from family and friends, is a video from her preschool graduation. <laughs> As Nicholas Castro charges the mic, she sits, ankles crossed and hands folded neatly in her lap, waiting for her moment to shine. And with apologies to anyone who can do a real Queen's accent, this is my domologue. Somebody please take my freaking statement so I don't gotta spend all night in handcuffs? Donna Scarpelli, one P, two L's. So I went to the bank this morning for a loan. I'm sick of waiting around for some damn man to save me. I'm not some freaking Cinderella, you know. So I'm online and Sherry's texting me that my Angelo's getting antsy. They're in the car because he's pouring buckets outside. There's puddles all over the bank. The woman online behind me is on the phone, talking so loud my dead mother could hear her. And her kid is throwing red suckers into the puddles, turning the water all red. Every time the door opens, it's like a freaking monsoon, and my good tan shoes are now three shades of brown. Finally, it's my turn, and I get this puffy red-faced woman who looks like she's about to pop. She's sweating like crazy, and I'm about to pass out from the smell, not to mention her breath. People like that need to stay far, far away from those everything bagels. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so she's asking me questions. I'm trying to be polite and all, but she's starting to take me off. I mean, of course I stopped paying the bills when Auntie left us. What was I supposed to do, let Angelo starve? Just because my husband took off with some prostitute and all of our money? <laughs> on and on with the stupid questions. I'm getting a migraine already. Suddenly, the door busts open. And in comes three guys in big, wet raincoats. The kid with the red suckers dives under my chair, gets my heels all sticky. One of the guys stays by the door with his back to me, dripping more rain on my shoes. The other two push right past all the people in line. Chinese lady with one of them woolly shopping carts, and the old guy from the bodega next door. I hear a pop, 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 and I'm thinking, shit, they're robbing the freaking bank, and I'm gonna die. My last <laughs> breath will be sweat, cherry suckers, and everything bagels. Then I remember my Angelo and think, hell no. I lunge at the guy by the door, buckle his knees, and he lands on top of me. He's got his foot in my face, and I recognize the shoe. Tommy O'Brien, size 12 Converse, with my initials in blue Sharpie on the toes. He rolls off and kisses me. The bank guards come out of nowhere and grab the other guys, then Bagel Breath comes over and starts screaming, I must be in on it. She slips and falls face down in the red puddle. The guards think she's been shot. Next thing I know, I'm handcuffed in the back seat of a squad car next to Tommy O'Brien. Now my kid is sitting out there with a pocket full of red suckers waiting for his mother. So please, either let me out of here now or bring me one of them cherry pops so I can get the taste of Tommy freaking O'Brien out of my mouth. <laughs> Thank you. Next up is Patrick Hammerhand.
Good evening. Earlier today I was introduced as Colin's granddad. <laughs> In London some years ago, a colleague, Janet, invited me to see a play. I was newly arrived from Ireland, so she was probably feeling sorry for me. You'll like the Cherry Orchard, she said. It's my mum's favourite play. To me at the time, Russian literature was Dr. Zhivago and Julie Christie. The only Cherry Orchard I'd ever heard of was a soccer club in Ireland that played in the same league as other oddly named teams, like Brain Unknowns and St. James's Gate. I bought a newspaper, and sure enough, there was a write-up in the Evening Standard saying a young Irish actress named Sinead Cusack was making her West End debut. Her father was Cyril Cusack, a famous Irish character actor, and she was going out with George Best, the top footballer in England and maybe the world, and he is Irish too. The following Sunday, wearing my best sports coat, I headed up west. Emerging from the underground, I saw Janet with a very attractive blonde. This is my mum, she said with a smile. Pam, but call me Pam, said the blonde, extending a manicured hand. Everybody does. Janet has told me all about you, Patty. I said nothing. We went to a cafe and had coffee from clear glass cups. Vile stuff, I remember. Pamela, I can't bring myself to call her Pam, sat across from us and kept referring to Janet and myself as you two. Bono and the Edge would have been in kindergarten. <laughs> I didn't like the sound of it. Here I was in my early 20s, newly arrived from Ireland, and I'm sitting across from a mother way too eager to find a man for her daughter. At least that's how I saw it. Do you have a girlfriend, Paddy, was the next question. No, not yet, I said lamely. I'm new here. I'm only here a few months. Or you'll soon settle in, and you'll love this play, I'm sure, Pamela went on. Janet's dad was supposed to come, but he'd prefer to play golf on Sundays. I'm delighted you could make it, though I loved meeting Janet's friends. I said nothing. In the theatre, Janet and Pamela sat on either side of me. I didn't know where to put myself. <laughs> when Pamela excused herself to go to the powder room, I turned to Janet and said, I'm surprised to find your mother here with us. She's great, isn't she, said Janet. <laughs> she, she had me when she was 18, the same age I am now. All my friends love her. I, I said nothing. <laughs> I thought I heard alarm bells go off, but it was a signal for the audience to be seated as the play was about to start. A grey, sparse, unpainted set and sad-looking bedraggled people slowly came onto the stage, <laughs> carrying bags and boxes. There was Sinead in the middle of them. I had eyes only for her. Pamela squeezed my arm and whispered, they're returning from Paris. I was there once. Remind me to tell you about it someday. <laughs> the play did nothing for me, and I remember thinking there was more drama going on in our role than on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was far too choppy for my liking, and I, but I thought Sinead was wonderful and her character far more interesting than the others. In the meantime, I had my own two characters to deal with. <laughs> During the last scene, when the old man was left alone on the stage, Pamela leaned over, squeezed my arm again, whispered, that's so sad. They forgot about him. It makes me cry every time. A woman wouldn't do that. I said nothing. <laughs> we parted at Leicester Square with quick hugs and handshakes, and the Piccadilly line was never as welcome. I didn't go home, but headed straight for Earl's Court, where I knew some of the lads <coughs> would be in a favourite Sunday haunt. Needless to say, they thought my afternoon with the girls was hilarious. <laughs> we're talking Irish men dulling the guilt of missing Sunday Mass yet again. We were easily amused. After a few pints, everyone agreed that Pamela was the better bet. <laughs> Janet never spoke to me again, as on Monday morning she overheard someone in the lunchroom at work laughing about my adventure with herself and her mom. She was furious. A few weeks later, she left for a better position, as we used to say, and Pamela came to the pub where we're having drinks to see Janet off. She approached me smiling and said it was a pity, as she thought I was a nice boy. She squeezed my arm again and said, I still have to tell you about Paris, Patty. Maybe someday. I said nothing. <laughs> Stop. 
my favorite English woman, Nicola Ruiz. <laughs>
If given the chance, if they don't get snatched up by eager kids with a net and a bucket, the female twists free and returns to sea with the next wave. The eggs, if not preyed upon by shorebirds, will incubate in the moist sand and will hatch the next time the tide is high enough to reach them and bring them back home to the ocean. But tonight, Mom and I are the only ones on the beach, so all the females will have a chance to wriggle back to sea. They have to leave, they have to leave their eggs behind to fend for themselves trusting that they'll hatch and grow and make their own way back to the ocean, back home. And one day, they'll be the ones on the sand, knowing ex ex instinctively what to do, laying their eggs under the moonlight. Thank you. sunglasses, something like that. So thank you for bearing with us uh, for this experiment. Um, seriously, though, the piece that I'm going to read tonight is an excerpt from my memoir in progress. Uh, it's the piece that I'm reading is titled Gladys. And really, all you need to know is that it's about a little old lady that was a regular customer in my family's restaurant in southern Indiana. A yellow taxi brought Gladys to Charlie Smorgasbord on Washington Avenue every day at 11 a.m., except Sunday. Too many Baptists on Sundays, she'd say. And after the taxi angled into the handicapped parking space between the street and the restaurant's front windows, customers watched as she pulled her tiny frame from the back seat while the driver retrieved her folded walker from the trunk, slipping it over his forearm. Escorted by the cabbie through the glass vestibule, and she gripped his free arm with one hand while carrying her empty snap lid water pitcher in the other. Once inside, at the foot of the open corridor with its iron handrail, the one that forced diners to fall in line during the noon or evening rush, the cabbie unfolded the walker and placed it in front of her. He would return in 90 minutes. Gladys watched him leave. When his red taillights signaled the all clear, she turned, secured the empty water pitcher atop one handle grip, lifted her walker with both hands, its green tennis ball feet hovering above the floor, and carried the aid down the long pathway around <laughs> her table, the one three rows behind the salad bar. Those tennis balls, they rarely have ever felt the floor. Placing the walker next to her chair, her empty pitcher on the table, she walked unencumbered to the stacked dinner plates alongside the buffet. A waitress would scoop up her pitcher, fill it with water, while Gladys piled her lunch plate with fried chicken, green beans, and mashed potatoes. All the fixings, she'd say. She ate her meal in the restaurant, but took her water to go. No one ever joined her. I never see you with anyone. Where's your family? I asked, sitting with her for a moment before the lunch rush. No family. She said, she reminded me of the great catbirds I often saw around my grandmother's bird feeder, rather unkempt, dark eyes that moved side to side, watching. Like those birds, she had a streak of vibrant color. You were never married? Oh yeah, I was married to Henry for 56 years. God rest his soul. What happened? Well, she began, 
We just finished breakfast at the kitchen table. I was clearing the dishes when he told me he was going to mow the yard. In summers, he liked to mow early, beat the hot sun. Next thing I heard was the kitchen storm door shut, then the mower engine. I would just filled the sink with water when he passed the kitchen window, pushing the full thing. Her expression became painted, her look distant. He never passed again. Gladys, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, sir, I pulled the curtains back, saw him face down in the yard. I can't imagine what you thought, what'd you do? I can tell you exactly what I thought. I thought, now who in the hell am I going to get to mow my yard? <laughs> I sat there, my eyes the size of dessert plates, mouth agape as the waitress approached, carrying the filled water pitcher. Then I called the ambulance, she said. <laughs> Welcome to the podium in just a moment, uh, Rakia Murat-Rashi. she thought of America. Navi told her to start packing, that he had found an apartment that was affordable and close to the subway. And that his commute from and his commute to and from Kashani, a rug gallery in midtown Manhattan, would be shorter. Navi told her that he had signed the one year lease agreement and handed over a wad of cash in exchange for a two bedroom apartment in Brooklyn, an unfamiliar place. Golsaman told looked up at the tall brick building, thirteen stories. She counted. The window sills were stained with cigarette burns and blotches of oil that looked as if it was sprayed on the kitchen wall. The faucet squeaked when Gulsaman turned the knobs in an attempt to wash her daughter Ramirez's sticky hands. But as they walked through the apartment, she did not point out these things that bothered her. The roaches that crawled on the counter and ran into the crevices. Naveed had been working long hours, six days a week, at Kashani, and she didn't want to hurt him after all the effort that he had put into making ends meet. She tried to ignore the mouth trapping she saw on the closet floor and inside the kitchen cabinets, hoping that they would suddenly disappear. Instead, she told herself that this is temporary, Naveed's exact words. When he asked her what she thought, she smiled and said, yes, it's fine. She knew it wasn't fine and that it was too late to ask. It was a statement, not a question. But a part of her meant it. She'd rather take roaches and crack tiles with gated windows over war. Bombs exploding, or a Russian soldier holding an AK-47 to Navid's temple, while the other assaulted her and stripped them of their valuables, or possibly being widowed yet again. Yes, it's fine. Those three words would do more, harm than good, for years to come. Naveed invited Habib over for dinner and told him that they will give their official answer, a gesture equivalent to, yes, our daughter accepts your proposal. They all sat around the dinner table, everyone but Hamira. Earlier that day, when Gulsaman and Hamira were preparing dinner, Naveed told her she couldn't be there. She was not allowed to meet Habib yet. It was considered distasteful and would make her appear desperate. He said that women in Afghanistan were not allowed to see their suitors, that their fathers, brothers, and uncles would meet him and relay all of the information. Or this desired girl would get a glimpse through the curtain that partitioned the guest room, separating men and women. Hamera felt angry when she heard these words and wanted to repeat her line that this is not Afghanistan. But she was afraid of what would happen next, what instrument would be used on her. Instead, she continued chopping the onions for the third dish, beef and potato stew. Teardrops formed. 
That evening, spoons and forks were clinking against the fancy china Gulsaman had purchased years ago from an out-of-business sale. It had an ornate design, but was less tr traditional than everything else they owned. The display cabinet was now partially empty, except <laughs> for crystal bowls, a pair of antique brass candle holders, a family heirloom. Things so fine, so precious, were protected. Hamari stayed in her room alone with a plate of food serviced to her door while the others sat in the dining room. It was customary that the groom-to-be come over with his parents or an aunt and uncle in their stead. But Habib came alone, and this made Hamira wonder how he knew of her, where he had desired her, and how he had found her doorstep. She put her plate down on the computer, computer desk and stopped eating. She took out all the clothes from the drawers and began to fold them neatly. The thin, poorly insulated walls made their conversation with Habib fully audible. She listened to him talk about his day as breakfast his day as a breakfast vendor near Wall Street, how he had built up his customers over the past three years since he came to America. He had his own corner from five in the morning until noon. The door was left open a few inches and Hamira caught a glimpse of Habib through the gap. She knew he wasn't 27 years old, not even close. Related information was always exaggerated, she thought. The bald spot on his crown area reminded her of a bird's nest. Only the existing, existing hair was jet black, freshly dyed two shades too dark. She saw all five, five feet, seven inches of him when he excused himself to use the bathroom. His mustache was in the shape of the letter M, a thick strip between his wide, flat nose and the pointy peaks of his upper lip. She wondered if he dyed his mustache too or his eyebrows, sparse and widely set apart. He wore the bluest denim jeans, Wranglers, and a gray button-down shirt unbuttoned at the top. The collar was stretched out, 70s style. Mm -hmm. When Habib returned to his seat, a conversation evolved from canary breeding to Nabi's work at the construction site, and finally, what Hamira feared most, Hamira's supposed answer that she accepts. Thank you. Please welcome Taryn Flame. This is a love story. It's entitled The Last Bite. <laughs> you're cold and you're drunk. Right now, you hate my guts. And I hate yours! <laughs> we find your Passat in the street, and not where I thought. I yell, that's not even the fucking car! You say, the fuck it isn't, it's right there, look! Look! We ate like gods tonight. Calamari with shiny souffle cups of marinara and cheese. Linguini and a molten white clam sauce. The venison entree. I got you the dessert special. I got you a piece of cake. I bought you that pineapple drink you wanted, with the fruit peel spiraling out of it. I bought you three. You shook off that shoe of yours and put your foot in my crotch. The cherry between your teeth. I gave the waiter 40% because you've shown me what true value really is. But. I said something about your friend Cecilia, and you removed your foot. <laughs> I said something like, how would you feel if... <laughs> and I don't remember anything else after that. <laughs> At the car, you say, you're driving, as if that's even a question. I shake my head and take a great big breath. I'm thinking of new ways to make you suffer. <laughs> Remarks to make you die inside. Grainy tongues of sleet slash the windshield. Wintry mix turning to ice later. It's supposed to drop into the teens later, according to God. <laughs> At the apartment, I slam out of the car and go around to your side. Are you coming? You don't say anything. Fine! I tramp off to the apartment. I take the first thing of yours I see, this big elephant-shaped pillow, and punt it into the wall. <laughs> then I put on my jacket and go back outside. 
I don't get this shit. Every time we go out, it feels like whenever me and you go out of this apartment, we come back like this. And then we have to play the lovey-dovey. You laugh and it scares me. The lovey-dovey? You've missed the point again. You stink. Fuck you. Get out of this car. It's freezing. I'm fine. <laughs> Get out of the Passat. Nope. My car. Ow! You put up your hood. Cut! I scream at the storm. <laughs> Inside, I turn on my record player. I put on the replacements. Our little living room swims with blue light from News 12 Long Island. A meteorologist is using her two hands to shove this nor'easter back and forth. <laughs> she speaks with dire certainty. She promises we have yet to see the worst of it. <laughs> Slowly, like a snake reversing back into its skin, I put my arms into my jacket. I make my way to the door, drowsy, feeling hopeless to change her mind. So all I do is nothing. Just check to make sure I didn't lock it. It's open. You'll find your way back to where it's warm, won't you? Like a snake? I wake up on the couch. The record player's crackling. Not just, not just hungover, I feel totally melancholic. Guilty. Broken. I will cook you an egg. Fry you a piece of ham. Cut a nice piece of bread and cook it in the same pan. I'll make your creamy instant mocha, and I'll put it in your cup. Hell, I'll drink some too. <laughs> I peek into the bedroom, expecting to find you shipwrecked near the bottom of the bed. A little fight still left over in your face. But you're not there. And there's not a scrape in the snow. I tramp through it to the car, the Passat, this white sugar-blasted shape. I have to punch the handle several times to break off the crust, and then I pull, 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 and it crunches open. And there you are. You look shocked to see me. You're dead. And you look like I just told a good one. I climb into the car and push your face. I stay that way on all fours, just sniffing at the air in disbelief. The whole car smells like pineapples. Thank you. <laughs> speaker will be Ricky Miller. This is from a personal essay called Chapter Two. I am sitting at my antique oak desk sobbing. The meandering wood grain and hand-carved draw poles bring me no solace. It is dark and dreary outside, with a few sorry-looking birds hanging onto the bare branches of the old tree by my window maybe realizing they have stayed too long. I ponder this about myself. It is Sunday evening, November 30th, and my retirement letter of intent has to be in by December 1st if I am to be guaranteed my insurance benefits and the hefty amount of money from my unused sick days accrued all those times I went to work sick as a dog, once even throwing up on the way, another time with a just broken rib from an altercation in my shower between me and a slippery bar of soap. I went to school with a swollen, broken nose the day after an out-of-control man crashed into me on a ski trail, the day after my dog died, a week after my father died, with a broken foot, a broken heart, a broken into apartment. For 35 years, I have been the teacher. Like the ever-ready bunny, I keep on going. But can I stop? Is there still a me without a them? In the 1970s, it was hard to get a job, but I was lucky. I had done an internship as part of my graduate work in a school 40 miles away from where I lived in Boston, and the principal asked me to interview for a first grade opening the next year. You'd be perfect for it. 
actually meant the job was already mine, but I was too dumb to understand that. I borrowed my friend Stephen's relic of a car, wore my favorite flower print mini dress, and as the wind blew through my long brown hair, Joni Mitchell sang on the radio, and I was off. I was 21 years old and plucky, and if this didn't work out, no problem. I just switched to another channel, and the journey began. 35 years later, my hair is now colored to cover the gray, at least six inches shorter, which my waistline has more than made up for, and switching the channel seems incredibly hard to do. I joined the New York State Teachers Retirement System in 1979, and 2009 was stamped on all my papers, like an expiration date on a milk carton. As my first year, of eligibility to retire. So far away, I never dreamed it would come this fast. One day after another, piled up through months and years and decades and family deaths and friends' illnesses and a long list of boyfriends, some good, some bad. Different hairdos, apartments, and couches. I skied, I biked, I traveled. I did the hustle, then the samba. <laughs> I took courses and more courses. Still the girl in the flower print mini dress, passionate about teaching, almost to glow in the classroom, so that if the lights were off, my energy would be enough. I loved the children and their sparkling faces. Like puppy dogs, they would tumble around, pay no attention, and then miraculously learn to read, do math, write cute little stories, even think and reason. How many people get to do something they love for 35 years and are actually really good at it? I say to my friends at a dinner in a favorite restaurant, no one I know answers Helen, and certainly no one at this table. Back at my desk sobbing, what will I do? Who will I be? How will I not get up each day and drive the four measly miles to my classroom? Will I still wear the Halloween socks and the reindeer antler hat that lights up at Christmas <laughs> and make my favorite rabbit cake for Easter, a holiday I don't celebrate? Will I race to the supermarket the day after each holiday to buy candy and stupid picture napkins half price? Will I stand up every morning to pledge allegiance? Will I ever again get notes left on my desk that say, you are the best teacher ever. Don't be mad, I forgot my homework. And <laughs> did you know last night I had die a rear? <laughs> all this thinking from September to November 30th has knocked me out. I am tired all the time. In the middle of the night I see 12-12, 3-33, 5.55 on my clock. My father was a math teacher. Is he giving me a sign? I break my foot on the stairs at Barnes & Noble. An accessorized van plows into my car, stopped at a light, and the apartment above me has a toilet break flooding my bedroom, all during the first week of school. I decide to take everything as a sign. The universe is conspiring. It is 10 p.m. November 30th. I can hardly breathe. I am crying so hard. I miss dinner. I never miss dinner. My fingers are poised at the computer over a blank document. My brother, who heads for the hills at the first sign of a tear, calls me up. I heard you were crying. Talk to me. The men are surprisingly better than the women. They all reassure me I will be fine. Just go with my gut. But does my gut say yes or no? Go or stay? How did I wind up doing something for two-thirds of my life? Aren't I only 35? What's left? I look out at the window ledge. I am taking a leap, a leap of faith. I breathe in and out. Rhythmically, I type. I will spend the rest of the school year happy and excited, anxious and sad. In my adult working life, I have never eaten lunch when I wanted to, or gone to the bathroom at whim, or had air conditioning in my classroom. I've eaten lunch from 12.40 to 1.40 for 20 years straight. I vow to never eat lunch during that hour, not even if I'm starving. I will not jump out of bed and say the Pledge of Allegiance either. I will talk to Tracy, the policewoman, I'm sorry, the postwoman, when she delivers the mail, my neighbors outside my door, and watch TV late at night. I will accept phone calls after 10 o'clock. I will travel on non-school holidays. I will blast air conditioning on myself in September and June even if I'm not hot. I will no longer always feel anxious, like I forgot to do something. I will love Sunday nights most of all, like a bubble bath. I will luxuriate in time. I will use my Bose clock radio only for the radio. I will get up whenever the hell I feel like, 
unless I have to make an early spin class. I will find out who I am. I take the Winnie the Pooh key ring attached to my school keychain and put it on my house keys. It serves as a reminder, a bridge from there to here. I have been given a chapter two. I love chapter one. But everyone knows the real action doesn't get going until chapter two. <laughs> John Carroll wanted to practice with her. Before he got up in front of his colleagues to present the National Training Program, he wanted to make sure he sounded right, could anticipate their questions, and had smooth transitions between transparencies. He called this the white space. The segues between each point had to be planned for. Rosalie taped the sheets of transparency film into frames, put a newfangled sticky note on each one with suggested comments. What's this, he said, unsticking and repositioning the yellow note. Post it, she said, 3M. What the heck? He caught himself. She routinely heard him swear at people on the phone when his office door was open. He must have gotten a memo about not swearing around women. Where'd you get these? My boyfriend's brother goes to Boise State, she said. They're test marketing them in Idaho. Can you get me some? It would be so easy to hand over the remainder of the pad she had come to venerate. It did not need to be explained. That's what Rosalie loved about it. Intuitive, like kindergarten kids pulling pigtails and skipping out to recess. No instructions needed. No parental supervision or directive from the boss. Unlikely, John, they're not on the market yet. Could you try? I wouldn't hold out any hope. Here at last was common ground. They both had a soft spot for office supplies. <laughs> Despite her gnawing hate for her bully boss and her larger question about just what it was their efforts added up to, her single reliable personal joy was in a daily visit to the supply closet. It was like a candy land for working adults, where instead of gumdrops, you could find sharpened pencils and virgin bottles of Elmer's glue, as though a craft project were possible in the cresting boredom of late afternoon. John's secretary, Geneva, granted her access to the key, right drawer, in a small white envelope sized to accommodate two side-by-side -side chiclets, secreted underneath a giant pink eraser. With this tacit permission came an unspoken blessing. Take what you need and go in peace. <laughs> the supply closet delighted Rosalie with its unblemished stacks of lined legal pads, manila folders, and window envelopes. There were staples enough to last the next decade and paper clips in three different sizes. <laughs> Most of all, she loved the bulldog clips. She could press them open and shut and squeeze the flesh of her fingers between them, a technique she had found kept her awake around 3 o'clock when it was getting to be nap time. It wasn't stealing to take the occasional pad home, a box of paper clips, the wounded stapler with its clumsy way of reloading. Her latest acquisition was a pink while you were out pad, a useless resource at work in a world without a phone. <laughs> These small, occasional pinches could not be construed as theft, but rather extending workplace resources to support the time at home she devoted to work. She did take work home, and during Heart to Heart, when she wasn't cataloging the difference between Robert Wagner and Rocky, RJ could pull off an ascot, order dinner for his wife, appreciate Mrs. Hart's impetuous ideas. She proofread the training manual. The hearts were millionaires who solved crimes in their spare time, something she was increasingly open to as a career. <laughs> in between cruises around the world or simply eating fruit in their Beverly Hills home, the hearts would learn of a murder and putting cocktails on hold, solve it. This was the type of work she could be good at if given the chance. But if Rocky wasn't R.J. Wagner, neither was she Stephanie Powers. Rosalie knew nothing about yachting and could not materialize a chiffon dress to swirl around a dance floor in if her life depended on it. Her sleuthing was confined to the supply closet, which was becoming more of an afternoon stimulant 
than the vending machine coffee. She sniffed the closet whenever she entered its inter inner sanctum, <laughs> sucking back its primal aroma of glue and paint. All these objects of desire in one small space, a space in which Clark Kent could become Superman. The supplies carried with them the weight of possibility, the inevitable forward moment, movement if only one persisted. Yes, work was getting done despite the glacial pace of things. Something was moving down the conveyor belt. Documents fresh from the typewriter, worthy of being stapled, slid into a folder and labeled with precision. Everything could be found in that supply closet, except three things. A phone for Rosalie, a pad of yellow sticky notes that her boss coveted, and a clue to who or what she was becoming. Thank you. to introduce a bold and talented writer and the world's best teaching assistant, <laughs> Susanna <laughs> Phillip. Hi, everyone. So tonight, I'm reading a section from my memoir called The Other Me. We're about two-thirds of the way through. What you need to know most, I think, is that about nine months earlier, my sister and I were held hostage, tied up, held at gunpoint, while a gang of professional hitmen attempted to kill her next door neighbor. Shortly thereafter, a whole lot of things in my life simultaneously fell apart. You'll hear my dog referred to. His name is Miles. He's diabetic and has one eye. Happy 30th from your LLL, the subject line says when the email chime dings. I immediately walk into the kitchen and pour myself another cup of coffee, mumbling to the thunderstorm gods that they could have taken away my internet as well as my early morning run. LLL means long lost little. That's what she is, my little, I'm her big. We're part of the Big Brothers Big Sisters of America program. Well, we were part of Big Brothers Big Sisters when I was in boarding school, but to me, she'll always be my little, even though it's been about six years since we spoke. She was on her way to college then. I plop down in the chair beside Miles in the windowsill and watch him watch the rain, putting off as long as I can opening her email. I'm sure she's accomplished amazing things. I imagine she's finished college, gotten an apartment, a job. Maybe she's thinking about graduate school. She's probably found her way. She's probably writing just to say hiya. It's how we always started our letters. Just me saying hiya. My little wasn't like all the other littles in our program. She was older than most, having already started fifth grade when we were matched. Rather uncharacteristically for big brother, big sister, they let her mom help pick me as her big. It wasn't that she was a neglectful or missing parent. She was a single mom with two kids and two jobs. She lobbied for her daughter to be a little because she wanted her to have a big to talk to about college and sports and boys. Her mom told me she wanted to be sure her daughter was exposed to people as big as her dreams. She was afraid she didn't always have enough time or energy to cultivate them herself. They lived in a condo on the outskirts of town, so my little didn't ride the bus to school on Friday nights. Instead, she climbed out of her mother's rust-colored Honda in front of the main school building and sat on the wooden bench. Sometimes her little brother snuggled into her side, asking over and over if he could stay and play too. I always thought it was better that she didn't come on the bus. We said her being dropped off was a privilege she had earned. When we did something special, like see the dance recital, or bake cookies, or go to town for dinner, her mother and I arranged for her to come early or stay late. We thought she should be able to earn certain privileges with good grades, or by being respectful. My little and I looked alike. Blondish, curly hair we didn't know how to control. A basic uniform of khaki pants and sneakers, always prepared to participate in or watch an athletic event. She greeted me with a hug and a once-over, evaluating my outfit and surveying my pockets for a new book or a mixtape. In the dining hall, we found an empty, round mahogany table on the edge, where her friends from school often joined us with their own trays of chicken pot pie. They were faculty kids she knew from school, her mom and I liked to encourage their friendship because they kept my little out of trouble. So it became four fifth grade girls and I gossiping about the upcoming after school movie event. 
We talked about their teachers and running for student council and growing up to be doctors or scientists or professors. When the weather was nice, we'd hike up to the rock overlook behind the dorms and act out Washington to Lincoln, the play they were putting on at school. Or we'd recruit Anna and her friends and race each other around the track. In the winter, we spent a lot of time mapping the stars in the planetarium and then on the basketball court. Each week ended with a trip to the Greer store for milkshakes and giant chocolate chip cookies in front of the large screen TVs where we could watch the boys watch sports. Before we left, we went around the table making a promise to each other about what we'd work on that week, being nurse to the person we didn't like, getting an A on the geography test, finishing our free read book so that next Friday we could have book club night. My little mentored me as much as I mentored her. She reminded me each week of the possibilities that lay ahead if I kept working. I didn't come from money or have the right connections for college and boarding school pressure can be stifling. But my little, little never let me feel that way. She loved the old mustard yellow chair in my room and when I graduated, she sat beside Anna. She thought it was okay to hold my hand when we went to the radio station to sit in on a friend's radio show. Family and friends are all you need in the end, she'd say. And you know what? You're my friend. I hope on her 30th birthday, she doesn't feel as I do now. What will she think of the woman I've become? Will she wonder what happened to her big, where she got lost? I wonder what happened to the big her mom picked, the one my little looked up to, from whom she garnered the conviction that she too could become something. What if she is close by and wants to see me? If she knew this is what I was thinking, she'd call me a coward. I'd try to laugh, but I'd tell her she was right. I finished my coffee, vowing that it was my last cup of the day, and go back to her email. Sure enough, her note goes on for pages, she tells me about where she lives and what she does. While in college, she too became a big, offering a younger girl an older friend. She did it, she said, because of me. She thinks of me, of everything I gave her, and she hopes that I'm well. I read it again. I realize it sounds like her, but more confident. And I miss her hugs. She is lively and joyful and full of triumph. I don't know how long it will be until I can, I can write her back. Right now, I don't even know what to say about myself. I'm certain I'll only disappoint her. I'm not sure I can yet articulate in one note everything that has happened and also that I think I'm getting better, that now I'm finally finding my way. I long to have her back, but more than anything, I want her to know that I'm proud of the woman she's become and of the strength she's found inside herself. I know it was always there. I hope someday she'll understand why it takes me so long just to say hi back. So I would like to ask Susanna to stand and Flo and Patrick Hunrahan. <laughs> Where's Veronique? Is she still here? Anyone else? This is your last semester? I think I have everyone. Congratulations.